My name is Noah Cameras with LA Sports Report, and today I am joined by a very special guest, a two-time NFL Pro Bowler, a All-Pro NFL tight, and a Super Bowl champion, 63 career receiving touchdowns, and on top of that, an actor, a producer, a television <laughs> show host, a television show judge, and now an author, and finally, one of the best smiles in NFL history, Vernon Davis. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, uh, thanks for having me. So, Vernon... I got to start with one of those last things I said. You are now an author. You just wrote a book titled Plain Ball Life Lessons from My Journey to the Super Bowl and Beyond. Now, I had an opportunity to read the book. Highly recommend it to everyone, not just football fans, but everyone because it has a lot of life lessons, life advice, and you just have an incredible life story overall. So <clears throat> any specific questions about the book, but first I just want to ask you, which I know you answered at the end, but what was the motivation for writing it? And then just tell us a little bit about, about the book in general. Yeah, my motivation for writing the book is to was to... Um... <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to inspire people and just give my story because I feel like my life, the life that I live in such a short period of time is a, is more than enough to be able to uh, give people a glimpse of what it's like to um, persevere, have resi- uh, be resilient, and just to overcome a lot of obstacles and, and things of that nature. I remember when I was struggling with panic disorder and the first thing I did was pick up a pick up uh, search for different books that could help me, and I found quite a few. And I'm hoping that my book would do the same thing for other people. And a lot of people also also ask, why did I decide to write a book right now? You know, why not wait? I don't feel like there's there's enough time to wait. I feel like there's not an expiration date on life. There's no telling if I'll be able to write a book in 10 to 20 years, you, you just don't know. There's a, there's some uncertainty there, but all we can do is keep the hope and have faith. But life is all about experiences. You know what I mean? And, and this book is about, this book is about, if I had to say this book is about um, overcoming, this book is about not being afraid to take chances. That's what that's what you're going to get when you open it, open that book. That's definitely what I got. I mean, you again, you had a, quite an incredible amount to overcome in your life. Um, a lot of the books about your relationships, you know, with your siblings, with your mother, with your grandparents. I want to ask a little bit about the relationship with your mother. Um, you know, it was not an easy relationship growing up. You know, mm-hmm. she has a drug addict. You said that she once stole your Christmas presents, you know, to sell them to get more drugs. I mean, that is so hard as a child. But you say something really amazing in the book. I'm just going to read it right here so I don't misquote you. You say that she inspired you because you say, quote, I didn't want to turn out to be anything like her or the people who lived around us. I wanted to be better than that. I wanted to prove something and felt like I had something to prove. How are you able to develop like this mindset and turn her into an inspiration in your life? Early on, you don't know what's happening. It's all about trusting the process. As a, as a young kid growing up, I didn't know that my, grand, my mother would eventually one day become my inspiration. I didn't know it, but as time continued to go on, it was the only thing I had. You know, I, it, it, it was what it was. And in order for me to be successful, I had to use something. And we all need something. We need fire up under us to motivate us sometimes to, well, most of the time, to really get what we want and to get what we're going after. You know what I mean? And, it's just, and that's just what it's about. And I, um, I use that. I use my mom. All of the pain, all of the joy, the good times, the bad times, I let that be the catalyst for um, my success. Yeah. And I, I love how you say that you were able to go back to Washington at the end of your career, mm-hmm. rekindle that relationship with her and you know, kind of mm-hmm. end with positive memories and, and all this type of things. Now, another thing you had to overcome um, in your NFL career was, you know, the infamous press conference with Mike Singletary when he, you know, publicly berates you and I mean, it's amazing how you kind of say that that moment changed the course of your career. Now, I would love to know, I I know you talk about it in the book, but I'd love for you to tell the viewers too, like how were you able to use that moment to change it? And then also Mike Singletary then writes the introduction to your book. So how has that relationship evolved with him where, you know, he's now this important figure in your life? Yeah, well, initially when he, when we had the rant, when he, where he sent me to the locker room on national television, initially I didn't know what it was. I, I thought he was totally against me, but as... Uh, the day when we sat down, I felt something, and I and I thought of, I thought about it. I was like, you know what? This is a great moment for me. 
this man cares about me. He's helping me. I'm obviously not doing what I'm supposed to do as a teammate, as a leader. There's, I have to get better. And I knew that. And now that I'm older, I'm sitting here 40 years old. <clears throat> and I reflect back on that time in my life. I'm thankful. I'm honored that Coach Singletary was right there because I needed him. I didn't know I needed him, but I needed him. And he believed in me. He saw something that I didn't see in myself. And since that day, we've always been um, in touch. Yeah. We've always been in touch. I always make sure I check up on him, I, you know, whether it's through his, his family or, you know, someone that knows him or just reaching out to him in general. You know, I have his number so I can just give him a call. But I reached out to him about this book and he said he would be elated <laughs> to be a part of it. That's so awesome. I mean, it, it is amazing how that moment really shaped everything and now how you guys are still in touch. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to, I mean, this is LA sports, but we're in Los Angeles. So you played under Jim Harbaugh for, you know, four years, 2011, 2014. Um, and you say about Harbaugh that you can instantly feel a change when he took over. You say, as soon as coach Harbaugh was introduced to the team, you could feel his energy right away. He had a charismatic way about him that gave you confidence immediately. The whole team could feel it. He had a lot of personality too. We just knew we were onto something. So my question to you is, you know, you know, now he's in Los Angeles, they're two and one to start the season. Do you think that the Chargers could have that similar immediate turnaround with Jim Harbaugh now that, you know, you guys enjoyed? Yeah. Yeah. I think Harbaugh, he's that's that's just how he's wired. This is, he has a unique ability to be able to turn any team around. We've seen it over and over. You go back to the, to Stanford, to San Francisco and to Michigan. He's done it multiple, on multiple occasions. It, it's just, it's a gift. It's a gift. And I, and I strongly believe that he'll do the same thing with the San Diego Chargers. If it doesn't happen now, it's going to happen eventually. Yeah. And what do you, what do you think it was about him that really brought the best out of you as a player and then also just your team in general? He has, um, a lot of people have, he, he knows exactly what it takes to be able to get someone or a group to rally behind him. He has, he has a formula, whether it's a formula, whether it's just his personality, he, he has that, that. And that's just something that can't be taken away. He's, he's either born with it or something that was taught. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but being around him, just seeing how he operates as a as a coach, as a businessman, as a leader, he has all of those qualities that it takes to to be able to to win and lead. And and guys believed in what he was trying to do. And I guess that's the thing. You know, that's the thing that he has. You know, when it comes to to a team, a group of men, they believe and they respect. They respect him as a coach, and he know he knows how to get the best out of his player. Yeah, he's done it at every level, and he'll likely continue to do with the Chargers here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the tight end position. So you were drafted six overall at the time; no tight end had been drafted. Mm -hmm. high. We're tied with Kellen Winslow. Recently, that was broken by Kyle Pitts a few years ago. But it kind of feels like you ushered mm -hmm. in this new era of tight ends. You know, big but also really fast. You know, you can run, you can block, you can kind of do a little bit of everything. So how have you mm. seen the tight end position evolve? And where do you kind of can see it, can see it continue to evolve over the next few years? I think the tight end position is, is, is definitely evolved to, to a point where um, they're doing a lot of the same things they did with me when I was playing. But the thing is, they're, they're the, the mismatches, I, I just, they're, these teams are doing a, a a great job getting these tight ends in space where there's no one around, right? If you watch George Kittle, whenever he catches the ball, it's like, gosh, how do you get that open? How do you get open like that? It's like wide open. But the plays are designed that way, and I think they're they're exploring and they're doing a great, a terrific job with that. And um, they're they're being utilized in a, in a way where they get the ball in and make in space where they can make get, uh, you know make something happen after the fact. And that that's that's what we're seeing. It's it's not a lot of, you know, trying to force the ball downfield. Is you know, it's it's immediate, and the flats, whether it's a stick route where you push up five yards and then turn out, or uh, getting over the middle of the ball. You know, if those linebackers are dropping out, you might see a tight end like whether it's a crossing route or just sitting over finding that void. You know, that's that's the biggest thing: finding the void, filling the space. 
Yeah, I love the word mismatch you used in the book. Also, you say like with the 49ers coach, it just kept saying to you, I mean, you are a mismatch. You know, you're too fast for the mm-hmm. linebackers. You're too big for the safeties. And in the NFL, there's definitely a lot of guys like that. Which tight ends do you kind of see the most that kind of are emulating your game right now? Maybe it's George Kittle. I mean, he has the same number, but who are some of those tight ends that are kind of doing that? Oh, George Kittle, for sure. I mean, that dude is, a, he's tough, man. He's tough. He's not afraid to block. He does all the dirty work. He's selfless. He's he 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 does a great job with getting the ball and, and getting on field right away. That's one thing the coaches always um, harp on is is catching the ball and getting up field A to B right away. And and I actually struggled with that early on. You know, I would catch the ball and I would dance around. But no, you don't want to dance around. You want to catch, put your foot in the ground, and get up field. Yeah, I mean, he does he does a wonderful job of that. He is one of the best at yards after the catch. And yeah, just immediately yeah. going straight. Um, another tight end, one of the best ever, you know, nine-time Pro Bowl or four-time All-Pro, Travis Kelsey. I mean, he's been the best for so long. This year, for the first time, it's almost, he's not as involved in the offense. I mean, he's doing a lot of different things. He still has those explosive plays, but it's hard to kind of sustain success for so long. You did it for a really long time. Mm-hmm. What are you seeing from Travis Kelsey? Do you think that this is kind of like maybe, I mean, how much does he have left in the tank is really, you know, kind of what I'm No, looking. no, I think... I know where you're getting at. I just I don't think that's it. I don't think the issue is whether he has a, enough left in the tank. Mm-hmm. I think the thing is is just sometimes uh, when you involve different weapons within the offense, or uh, maybe the game plan changes or mm-hmm. a little bit, or maybe um, just uh, just by coincidence that this this player is getting open a lot more, so I'm going to go here. I, I don't think the issue is – it's just – sometimes it happens that way. Like you say, he's yeah. still making explosive explosive plays, but he's probably not the focal point in the offense mm-hmm. anymore. And, and it happens that way. It's not It's not anything against Kelsey. It's just, yeah. the, it's just the business. You know, it's the business of football. Um, and, and, and like you said, you're not going to always be the focal point for 10 yeah. years, mm-hmm. you know, 10 to 12 years. It, it's just not going to happen that way. It's just – it's all it's all about the progression of the of the game, progression of the plays, just how it happens. Yeah. I want to ask a little about your former team. So, you know, you were with them for 10 years, the 49ers. You get to the Super Bowl with them, you kind of on the doorstep, just fall short. Then you go to the Broncos, you do win the Super Bowl with them. Now they've kind of been in both situations. You know, the 49ers are a team that have kind of been right there now three times and even a couple of NFC championships games. What do you think the 49ers need to do to get over that hump and finally get that Super Bowl for the first time in three uh, 30 years? I think they need to just do understand the, the the essence of of where they are in any given moment. Like, you know, it's one thing to make it there. They obviously did everything they possibly could to make it to the championship game, which is the Super Bowl, of course. But what happens? Why what why can't why can't a team continue to play the same way they did the game before? Mm-hmm. What happens in that game? I mean, a lot of things can happen. I mean, it's, whether it's the play calling by the coaching staff, it could be that the guys are just not in sync. It's, anything can happen. I mean, it's, and, and that's what we saw in that game. The 49ers didn't play the way they've been playing all season long. There was a lot that was that happened in that game that exposed them, Right. And maybe, you know, a lot of the, the the exposing that we saw happened during the regular season, but it just, you know, just the timing, the timing of that game. But, you know, I don't know. I, I just think they need to really make sure they understand how important that game is if they make it that far again. Yeah. You know, the coaching, whether it's the coach, the coaches, the players all together, because you, you don't get that shot. I mean, it just don't happen that way. It just don't happen. It's, it's few and far between to be able to make it to the Super Bowl. Yeah. And they've now been there, you know, three times the last 10 years and a couple of times at your Super Bowl, you know, you got a goal to go to win, you know, against the Chiefs, they get to overtime this year. So they're right there, but it, it is definitely one of those things of just trying to get over right. the hump. Um, I want to talk about you a little bit more. You do tons of different charity work. You have the Vernon Davis, I think the 85 Foundation, and you have a few other things to talk about, Read 85, all these other things. How do you decide what's important to you to kind of, hone in on and try to, you know, make a difference in the world. Yeah, I think it, what's important to me, you, what, you you have to understand what you what you're into like as a as a human being. And to me, I'm into doing right by people. I'm into 
um, uh, doing the right thing. I love giving, and it's it's just it's just natural. It's just natural for me to be able to to give back in so many ways. Um, it just makes me happy. It gives me something to live for, and I think, and and that's what life is. Life is all about finding that thing that makes you happy, that gives you, uh, that 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 allows you to be able to thrive. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what gives me. That's what makes me. That's what gives makes me excited. I get excited when I wake up in the morning because I know there's an opportunity for me to be able to have an impact on somebody's life. That is, I mean, that is such an incredible mindset. Um, all right. So another question you kind of hinted at at the end of the book, but you know, you've succeeded at every level in football. You won your Super Bowl. You've acted, you've produced, you have an art gallery, you own Jamba Juices, Dancing with the Stars, Vernon Davis Foundation. You're an author. It really feels like you've done everything and you know, you're only 40 years old. So uh, what, what's next for Vernon Davis? What, what What's the next big thing that's going to be coming up? <laughs> like I said, I just find joy in, in the things that I, that I like, the things that I'm into. And it's, it's, it's only just it, it may, to be able to, to do something, challenge myself and have some success at it. That's that it is nothing like more than that. Just the feeling of being just working and being busy. I love working. And if you have that, attitude that approach and i know that's hard to do for a lot of people it's not easy to just get up and have the energy and, and enthusiasm to be able to to want to work there's a lot of people that don't like working you know and i and i and i can understand how you can become complacent and, and you can get in that that space is because sometimes that kind of space feels good right i used to be at that point i used to be the guy who who felt like i was good not doing anything mm -hmm. right but then something woke me up and it doesn't happen like that for everybody. You, you just gotta, you, you got something you gotta find and, and, and may, meditate and pray about, but that's, that's just how it's been for me. I want to end this with a couple rapid fire, fun questions. Um, they're going to be super quick and just whatever comes to mind first. Um, uh, okay. Favorite teammate or teammates of all time. Frank Gore, my favorite teammate of all time. Uh, what's your favorite memory from your NFL career? My favorite memory from my NFL career is going to the playoffs for the first time. We played against the New Orleans Saints, <laughs> and I actually had the game-winning catch. I remember the catch part three. So, so thank you. I mean, I, I had a feeling it was going to be that one. That was definitely my favorite memory of yours. But then when I read your book, I, it might be your last touchdown also, because the story with your grandfather and how you kind of said he like carried you into the end zone. So I don't know. I feel like now it's kind of a close second between those two, um, but obviously can't go wrong. Um, all right. One quarterback past or present who you wish you could play with. One quarterback past or present that I wish I could play with Tom Brady. That, and that's a simple answer. Uh, one of the best, maybe the best ever. Um, okay. If you had a movie about yourself and you were not the lead actor, who would you want to play you? I want Michael B. Jordan to play me. That's uh, that's another great answer. Um, okay, what's been the best advice you've received in your acting career, and who did it come from? The best advice that I've ever received in my act acting career is to, um, gosh, that's a good question. Probably do the work. Yeah. Do the work, meaning uh, do the work and don't stop doing the work. The work is the preparation, mm -hmm. right? The preparation is the biggest part to, I mean, preparation in anything is the biggest part, but when it comes to acting, sometimes we don't, we, we think we can get a, you think, you think you can get a script and just kind of just break it down, but you got to do the work, the backstory, you got to uh, create, you know, figure out the things that this character likes, what they're saying about him in the script, all those different things. And that's doing the work, putting it together, paraphrasing, coming up with emotional statements and um, beats and actions. Putting all that thing into this character, man, is that's doing the work. Yeah, I, I, you definitely approach acting the same way you approach football. And it sounds like you approach everything that way. So, I mean, that's why you're kind of the best at everything you do for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. Okay, right now, top five tight ends in the NFL. Mm, top five tight ends in the NFL. Of course, George Kittle and um, Travis Kelsey. Ooh. 
Top five. That's a, that's a hard one right there. I don't, we can also do top, top two, five. top three. <laughs> um, who else? We got, you know, we got Sam Laporta. We got, I mean, Kyle Pitts. We got. No, I like, I I don't know where to rank them, though. I mean, I, I don't like Kyle Pitts, but I don't know where, I don't know where I to know. put them. <laughs> A lot of time. I, 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 if I, yeah, if I had to, if I had to say, um, it's hard to say. Of course, you want to go with the older guys, the guys who've been around a lot, but they've been the most productive between George Kittle and Travis Kelsey. I mean, there's, that's without an argument. Um, it, it, probably it, Kyle Pitts, I would say. Yeah. Oh, probably yeah. Kyle Pitts. Yeah, I, I give you my I give you three. Yeah, and very soon Brock Bowers might make a make a name for himself there. He's already off to a good start. Um, okay, this one might yeah, be... Yeah, yeah, we'll see how consistent he can be. Exactly. He had a historic start, and then we'll see what he can do. All right, this one might be, this one might be harder. Yeah. I don't know. All-time Mount Rushmore of tight ends. So four tight ends all time. Oh, easy. Tony Gonzalez, Tony Gates, Shannon Sharp. Rob Gronkowski. Um, I, that's a great top four to me. And, and you're right there too, you know. Nah, I won't <laughs> put me in it. Well, that is gonna be my you last. Put, you, you can yeah, put me in it. I'll put you. I mean, you're, yeah, you're gonna be in mine for sure. I grew up a Niner fan, so you're absolutely right. in mine. <laughs> um, okay, last one. You're eligible for the Hall of Fame this year. You talk about it at the end of your book. I know you did a lot of research on the Hall of Fame and everything like that, and you kind of said, you know not in my hands whatever happens happens but if you had to make a case for yourself tell me why vernon davis belongs in the pro football hall of fame um if i had to make a case for myself i would say um i was never asked that question let me drink a little bit of my coffee yeah, take take your time i mean it, it, it's a big question so i would say that um I, I feel like if, if a player has always been, if you look at a team and and you look at the the the, the trajectory of a player of a player, right? How many years has this player play has this player played in the league? All of the years, how many years has this player been the the center point, the focal point of the team? Not only focal point, was he the threat? How much of a threat was this player that they had to account that every team that this player had to account? play against did they have to account for this guy did they, how, did they plan to stop this player was this player disruptive how long how many years um the records i would look at the the amount of records that have been broken you know there's a there's a lot of records that are not talked about i think that i have um and, and just it's just little things like you, you know like uh touchdowns over 10 touchdowns how many times are Tight end scored over 10 touchdowns. You know what I mean? The the yards, uh, it was the, the most yards that the tight ends had in one game. Uh, the most yards in in um in the Super Bowl, right? Um the most touchdowns in 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 playoffs. All of that, all of those things go into to the factor. And I feel like when it comes to those those numbers like touchdowns and um um just the the, the records. That have been broken. Where, where, where do I, where I stand in conversation with with records? I think if you look at that, then that alone should put me in there. I bet you, if you asked every defensive coordinator who faced you throughout your career and said, "Is Vernon Davis a Hall of Famer?" they would, without a doubt, say one hundred percent. We had to do everything to stop that man. That man needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, now, now you asked the exactly. You asked the defensive coordinator. Any defensive coordinator that I've been that I've gone up against in the last fourteen years, you asked them that question. They they'll, say that man. That man. Yeah, they'll, 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 yeah, they'll give you everything you need. <laughs> well, Vernon, thank yeah, you. Yeah, honestly, you know what? I honestly yeah. felt like I honestly felt like I'm gonna tell you the truth. Like I never really watched my 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 competitor. I never watched who I was going against. Mm -hmm. I would always watch like like how the defense was playing. But if there was a guy that was supposed to cover me, I never really watched him because I felt like I didn't really need to know his tendencies because I know I was going to go out there and beat him. <laughs> I just I, I just believed in myself that much that no matter who I was going up against, I was going to beat him. 
mean, that that is the mindset of a champion for sure. And the mindset of a Hall of Famer, in my opinion, for sure. I mean, it doesn't matter who's in front of you. Well, thank you. That's that's you that's my case. That's my case right there. <laughs> well, I will make sure everyone sees this right here. Every voter sees this and they can make the case for you because I, I definitely believe that you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, <laughs> before I let you go, just tell just tell us where we can find your book and where we can buy it. And again, I highly recommend everybody read it. So just kind of tell us that. Yeah, right. you go. Yeah, you go to Barnes and Noble, Amazon. It's it's pretty much everywhere. Any book platform you you can think of. But those are the top two. And um, I encourage everyone to take a read. I think it's a great read. There's a lot in there to to learn about myself and uh, just uh, if you if you want some motivation and and you just need something good, wholesome, like inspiration, you can read this book. I because it's there. I agree with everything you said. I recommend it to everybody. And again, Vernon, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed reading the book. And again, highly recommend everybody go get a copy and read this book. Thank you.